There is often a misunderstanding when it comes to one house in particular. A pervasive meme has run through the internet, obscuring the truth, and really guiding newer players into a mode of thinking that isn't really related to reality. In this video, I am going to be covering one of the most superb light mechs ever constructed. Hitting like a medium mech, moving like a light mech, and being heavily armored. This battle mech was built to chase down and destroy anything the Draconis Combine could throw at the mighty Leering Commonwealth armed forces, when used appropriately. Built on the capital world of Haus Steiner, Tharkad, by Tharhes Industries, let us begin examining the pride of the Commonwealth. The Wolfhound. A light mech weighing in at 35 tons. The Wolfhound is a weapon of war, built to save the Lyran Commonwealth from humiliation and the most dangerous of situations, the appearance of weakness. One may be shocked to have this news delivered, to hear that the mighty Lyran Commonwealth armed forces could be perceived in such a way. The Lyrans, after all, are renowned for their ability to deploy large formations, typically of heavier mechs, at a rate that frequently couldn't be answered by other houses. The problem was, by the end of the Third Succession War, this industrially backed strategy had been put on display as a farce for all the world to see in multiple scenarios. Yes, the Lyran Commonwealth when raiding a world or attacking a planet, could deploy heavier machines than their enemies, and often in greater numbers. But this tactic wasn't always sound in every circumstance. Worse still, often the leadership headed by Haus Steiner and their armed forces were installed through heredity or financial backing. In essence, nepotism and cronyism. This also meant that many of these heavier, expensive formations would be put onto the field without capable leadership, or with adequate support and tactics in order to prevent them from being flanked and destroyed. These blows were also ironically delivered by either materially inferior forces, or numerically inferior forces of similar weight, or in some disastrous cases, numerically and materially inferior forces. One of the worst things any state or military can face is the delegitimization of the threat they can unleash against their enemies. Once foes realize their opponents are incompetent, potentially on multiple levels, and are either unable to defend themselves appropriately, or are unable to retaliate in a military sense after successful incursions, this can rapidly invite aggression. More critically, it can also undermine the faith of one's allies and supporters as well. Why would the duchies and provinces inside of the Lyran Commonwealth continue to support institutions and leaders that cannot benefit them, and cannot protect them? Should the military situation deteriorate enough, why would allies, such as their newfound friends in House Davian, support them and their interests, if they proved utterly incapable without their assistance? The problem needed to be addressed on multiple levels, but it also needed to be addressed with new military equipment, with ways around this problem being considered on multiple fronts. The Commonwealth had been successful so far in the introduction of the Hatchetman to the Inner Sphere, and prior to this they had supported Mountain Wolf battle mechs in their production of the Merlin. These mechs represented the first real leaps forward into new mech development since the beginning of the Succession Wars, and this know-how would be vital in the plans to solve House Steiner's issues. While both of these designs were important, with the Hatchetman in particular being innovative, they didn't solve the underlying problems facing the armed forces at that moment. Most notably, these problems were when House Steiner forces engaged with the Free Worlds League military, and even more so the Draconis Combine's mustered soldiery. Their mechs were typically harassed, and often destroyed, by significantly lighter assets fitting into the light and medium mech categories. This even created a sense of defeatism in the army, 
or a clearly rational worry and concern when engaging lighter forces by the rest of their own military. It was, as Archon Katrina Steiner I saw it, very much a humiliation, and a black eye on her own military prior to the alliance with her new cohort in her future son-in-law, First Prince Hans Davian. The Lyrans, strangely, had several very capable mechs that fit into the role of countering these light assets, in the form of the Commando, and even several variants of the Griffin. But these were known quantities by their Merrick and Krita adversaries, and neither was built with a dedicated anti-light mech role in mind. Through order of the Archon herself, Lyran manufacturers, now with an even greater expanded industrial base and knowledge, were ordered to develop a battle mech with a dedicated role of hunting down and eliminating enemy light assets, particularly targeting the Combine's effective Jenners and Panthers, but also taking other effective light mechs into account as well, such as Javelins or fire starters. This would truly be the beginning of the Wolfhound story. Tharhes Manufacturing would be the company that developed the solution that matched the Archon's orders. The Lyran State and Company would also partner with the Kelhounds Mercenary Unit, who were considered to be extraordinarily reliable and loyal to the current Archon on the throne in Tharkad, for testing this new machine on its trial runs. The Wolfhound Battle Mech would be designed to outmatch and overwhelm its opponents in every meaningful scenario. It would follow much of the Panther's body plan, but be more heavily armored than the already sturdy Panther series and it would outgun it as well. It would also have the advantage of range in the form of a large laser over the Jenner. There was also care placed into the WLF series as well to help preserve its pilots through a full head ejection system. Reasonably fast for its weight, heavily armored, almost as much as most medium mechs and sometimes even more, and able to outfight almost every other light mech to date. This new, ambitious design would cause havoc, if it passed its trials, of course. Just prior to the launching of the Fourth Succession War, in early 3028, the Wolfhound would begin its field tests with the Kelhounds. It would pass this stage with flying colors, entering full production prior to the end of the Fourth Succession War, which would start that year. During this Succession War, it was principally deployed in a testing format all the same, and was largely given to the Hounds, as well as to the Wolf's Dragoons, as its ultimate trial by fire as bugs and other elements were hammered out. It excelled in every major battle and theater it was a part of, and proved to be extremely effective against the mechs it was designed to destroy in the Draconis Combine, causing panic in the once superior light mech ranks of their enemies as well as helping with the Wolfhound's reputation. The Fourth Succession War proved the value of the Wolfhound. Better yet, it was more successful than anticipated, proving to be rugged, reliable, easy to maintain, and even had features to enhance pilot safety. This made it a favorite by the mercenaries who had used it, and their growing reports made their way back to New Avalon and Tharkad in the Alliance form state known as the Federated Commonwealth. Huge numbers were ordered by both the Armed Forces of the Federated Sons and the Lyran Commonwealth Armed Forces. Despite the new state, these two military entities would be distinct from one another until one of the great strategic mistakes of the history of House Davian, namely the War of 3039. Still, in the years after the Fourth Succession War, the Wolfhound would proliferate every single regular regiment in both militaries, and would also be outfitted into reliable and friendly mercenary forces as enormous numbers of these machines were manufactured. That reputation held in policing actions that the state was involved in during the interwar years, fighting off mercenary raids, pirates, and lesser periphery states. In 3039, First Prince Hans Davian would launch an invasion of the Draconis Combine in an attempt to utterly destroy, or even annex, his longtime rival. What followed, unfortunately, was an unmitigated disaster. The Fourth Succession War had been an overwhelming success on all fronts, but in part because of the surprise attack element of it. 
The War of 3039 faced a Combine that was more than ready for war, had been supplied for years by its allies in Comstar and the Free Worlds League, and had experience against House Davian's military tactics and strategies. It was also fantastically led by Carita Theodore, one of the great military minds of the 31st century. Worse still, with Comstar supporting them with communications, and undermining the communications of the Federated Commonwealth, as well as the Combine acquiring one of the alternative black boxes the Federated Commonwealth used for their private communications to avoid interception by Comstar, what followed was the only natural outcome. The aforementioned disaster. Outplayed in almost every sense, the Federated Commonwealth made few gains, and even lost several worlds in response. An armistice would be met when Carita Theodore bluffed, and convinced his Davian rival that he simply had even more forces than the Federated Commonwealth had taken into account. The weaknesses the Wolfhound had been designed to curb had been solved, yet the Federated Commonwealth's loss during the War of 3039 was both an upset and one which disrupted the air of invincibility around this once seemingly unassailable state. While the Commonwealth of the Steiners and the Davians was by no means viewed as pitiful, it could not simply bully its neighbors successfully, not without suffering for it in equal measure. But, in the midst of this defeat, despite serious losses suffered during their failed offensives, and eventually their rout, the Wolfhound would be amongst the least disabled and captured mechs of both the AFFS and the LCAF. The Combine had found no acceptable solution to the Wolfhound in its own ranks. It did its job, and not only well, but exceptionally at that, despite the overall defeat of the Steiner Davians. Several examples were captured nonetheless, and the Combine appeared to be quiet on the matter. Internally, they understood that this mech had been extraordinarily difficult for their own forces to fight against and some even called to outright copy the mech and put it into production as a result. Bluntly, pride alone prevented this from happening, and instead the Combine would take another path to solve its persistent near crisis when dealing with this battle mech. The only problem was, the solution, the eventual wolf trap, would be considered an utter failure. With success against other Inner Sphere powers, the Wolfhound would be one of the main staples of light forces in the now unified Federated Commonwealth military, the Armed Forces of the Federated Commonwealth. The name was sadly closer to the original Davian military, the Armed Forces of the Federated Sons, for sadly obvious reasons. House Davian's forces had a far superior reputation than their Lyran counterparts, which likely played a major role in the newly reorganized military taking on this name. The Wolfhound, a most capable battle mech, would, in its WLF-1 and WLF-2 forms, be at the forefront against the crisis which was to come. The Clan Invasion The Lyran Commonwealth had been the main industrial and financial power of the Inner Sphere, only rivaled but never overtaken up until this point by the Free Worlds League. Its wealth and industrial might had saved it from military and political crises time and time again. Now, as a part of the unified Federated Commonwealth, some of this wealth had fed into the Federated Sons, and over time a more even distribution of resources would be expected. Though the Lyran half of this alliance still possessed the overall greater total of industrial and financial power in the relationship. This, however, would be tested to its fullest limits with the arrival of the clans in 3049. Several clans would come into contact with the Federated Commonwealth in their rampage across the Inner Sphere on their way towards the ancestral home of all mankind, Terra. This assault would crash into the Free Rosselhaig Republic, Oberon Confederation, Draconis Combine, and of course, the Federated Commonwealth, like a tsunami, and was seemingly unstoppable. The clans had vastly superior technology and superb, 
trained from birth mech warriors. The majority of forces House Steiner Davian would face would come from one clan in particular, one only eclipsed in their ruthlessness by their smoke jaguar cousins, and that was Clan Jade Falcon. The Jade Falcon seemed utterly unstoppable in their advance, vanquishing local Steiner garrisons and shattering any regular units which found their way into the war zone. These victories came easy, and even respectable, newer battle mechs, like the Wolfhound, found themselves undone under these conditions. Three key issues began to unfold that would see the Falcon's flight cut short. First, Clan Jade Falcon had been too successful in its initial invasion and was beginning to outrun its supply lines, an issue other clans during the invasion ran into at least at some point. Second, regular AFFC units and mercenaries were beginning to arrive and in large numbers, stiffening resistance, and these troops began taking a larger material and psychological toll on the Falcons. Third, and finally, the legendary industries of the Lyran half of the Federated Commonwealth began to spin up in a dramatic way, and even more horrifyingly, their rivals, and one time second place industrial power, the Free Worlds League, expanded its own industrial base and began shipping immense quantities of war materials into their new allies in the struggle against the clans. The latter of these issues saw large numbers of wolfhounds entering service with mercenaries and regular units alike, even compared to before. This was due to its excellent performance. And, for an inner sphere mech, it was more than respectable against its clan adversaries. While still outgunned, and often outmaneuvered by clan battle mechs, the wolfhound was tough, and it was fast enough to stick to many of its enemies preventing them from simply ignoring the little beast and its needling attacks. This earned the mech an even more fantastic reputation, despite its shortcomings against mechs such as the Adder or Kit Fox. As a result of these factors, inevitably, Clan Jade Falcon's push into Steiner space faced a truly monumental failure. The Battle of Twycross began on September 10th, 3050 and it is the first major battle to see a complete clan defeat. Political concerns were a major factor behind the battle taking place, as how Steiner in particular had been politically suffering internally due to the decline of its military standing in the face of the loss of dozens of worlds, and the seeming complete inability for the AFFC to defend the member duchies of the former Lyran Commonwealth from the monstrous attacks and clan occupation. The best way to stave off this concern was for a victory. They needed a victory. An audacious counterattack was proposed, and it would end up on Twycross. AFFC units and mercenaries would play a role in the battle, as well as the famous Kai Allard Liao, who would, through his courage and valor, ensure the final victory of the attacking coalition. Much of the planet's defenders were second-line clan forces, who would inevitably lose to the invasion force despite putting up significant resistance. Unknown to the Fedcom attack, however, the Falcon Guard, an elite unit of Clan Jade Falcon, was still present on the planet. They would begin a counter-offensive of their own, before being killed in a trial, in their entirety, by Kai Allard Liao in what is known as the Battle of the Great Gash. Twycross was an immense victory, and one which saw the turning of the war effort, and the inevitable grinding to a halt of Clan Jade Falcon, with time. In 3052, the Battle of Tukyid would cease the invasion itself. Overall, the clan invasion and the eras that preceded it were the most significant eras for the Wolfhound service where it was one of the few inner sphere light mechs that could at least attempt to keep up with their clan peers. It was also stunningly effective against inner sphere adversaries as a result. It played its role well in Steiner Doctrine, preventing lighter elements from disrupting their heavier formations in their frontal attacks. It itself could often fight head to head with inner sphere medium mechs and was able to outdo and overwhelm the wolf trap the very mech specifically designed to defeat it.
The Wolfhound would go on to participate in every major war after the clan invasion, and would find itself largely orphaned in the Federated Sons after the Fetcom Civil War, due to all production of the Wolfhound being on Tharkad. Into the Dark Ages, it would still stand guard in later variants over the worlds of the Commonwealth, as well as be rightly and frequently deployed by the Kalhounds, a favored Steiner friend regardless of the turbulence of change in its administrations. It is a great shame that mechs such as the Wolfhound and Commando are so readily forgotten about. The truth is, these light battle mechs are not only extremely capable, but they are major components behind any success that House Steiner has. The light forces of the Lyran Commonwealth are second only to perhaps the Draconis Combine in the Inner Sphere, and even then, this is not a test they would be so quick to willingly bring upon themselves. The biggest reason for this can be narrowed down to one exceptional mech. The Wolfhound. The first model to be deployed in an official capacity as of 3028 is the WLF-1 Wolfhound. Built using standard technology for its day, outside of heat-related issues, it may well be able to outfight many of its more technologically advanced peers from later eras despite this. This still results in it having a standard gyro, internal structure, and cockpit all the same. Its onboard computer systems give it no additional bonuses. The WLF series as a whole does benefit, at least for pilot survivability in various environments, from the full head ejection system. This means pilots are more likely to survive should their battle mech be disabled or destroyed, and should they have the benefit of ejecting. For quirks, the Wolfhound has several, namely the easy to maintain quirk and the rightly earned good reputation quirk. Speed was most certainly taken into consideration with the design. While the WLF couldn't sacrifice so much tonnage as to run as fast as a Locust, it still needed to perform on the battlefield and to be fast enough to dissuade would-be flankers, or keep up with them enough to land decisive blows. This also benefits it by giving it the speed to flank heavier adversaries as well. The decision was made, therefore, to install a GM-210 Fusion Standard engine into the design, which weighs 9 tons and gives it a maximum speed of 97 kilometers per hour. This allows the Wolfhound to move up to 9 movement points in the tabletop game. One of the best qualities of the WLF series is its offensive power. Unfortunately, in earlier models, it is hampered by its ineffective cooling system, having only 10 base heat sinks. All the same, this is not the end of the world for this mighty 35-ton Maverick, as even in its base form, it can cycle its weapons based on operating ranges and deliver excellent results. For its primary weapon, mounted in the right arm, the WLF-1 has a Satanta large laser. This heavy weapon offers the Wolfhound the ability to strike targets at long range, and can act as a hole puncher into enemy light mechs, stripping away protection faster. It also helps that the WLF can run and fire its primary weapon without overheating. For when the fighting closes to a more optimal range for this close combat fiend, the Wolfhound relies on three forward-facing Defiance B3M medium lasers, which hit hard for this era of warfare for its tonnage. It also has a single rear-firing medium laser too, for if it is stuck in a mass melee brawl and needs to fire behind itself to dissuade back attacks. This combination of weapons earned it great notoriety, harassing targets with its large laser on the way in, or punching holes with the weapon before locking onto targets in close and scorching them with medium laser fire. This is an effective set of techniques for it to operate with, and it does so exceptionally well, especially because of its true most powerful feature, its defense. The Wolfhound's true strength doesn't lay with its well-planned attack power or its reasonable movement. It comes from its protection. The hardiest light mech built in terms of its armored protection by the Inner Sphere, at least at any quantity, the WLF, even in its base form, comes with a staggering 7.5 tons of armored plating. 
giving it a shocking 120 points of armored protection, which is comparable to 50 and 55 ton mechs like the Trebuchet and Dervish. This allows this light mech to weather incoming fire, even sometimes from heavy mechs. It also means that it can move quickly enough to gain significant defensive bonuses, which it combines with its armor in order to make it even more durable. Relatively difficult to hit, and heavily plated, the Wolfhound can grab hold of an enemy light or medium mech figuratively and just not let go. This is only possible due to the investments made into its armor. The Wolfhound, even in its original state, is one of the greatest light mechs ever built. It has the right balance of speed, firepower, and armor for its weight class. Much like the Wolverine 6M, which weighs 20 tons more, anything it can't outflank, it can outfight. Anything it can't outfight, it can outflank. It is also still dangerous enough that it can harm any adversary as well. It can't just simply be ignored. It can still pester other light mechs at range, and up close it can savage them, all while being extremely durable in response. Even medium and heavy mechs will find this cursed light mech able to do much the same to them, too. The Wolfhound is hardy enough that even its Succession War variant can at the very least successfully pull or harass clan counterparts, and might just live to tell the tale. The Wolfhound's reputation follows it for a reason. It will not come as a surprise that successful battle mechs that change the very nature of light mech warfare in the Inner Sphere also have a tendency to have variations and updates over time. The Wolfhound is prolific in this respect. Some of these models are iconic, like the first one displayed in technical readout form, the WLF-2, and others are simply updates of models with time, or pivots in design. In this video, we will be looking at three examples of this. Built by House Steiner on Tharkad after the War of 3039 and the lessons learned there, the WLF-2 is the most iconic wolfhound which was produced and served in the armed forces of the Federated Commonwealth. This was the wolfhound first introduced, as mentioned prior in Technical Readout 3050, and this is the mainstay wolfhound that would do battle against the clans during the invasion. It is one of the best and most simple upgrades to any mech of the era. It doesn't invest in XL technology as many of its peers, and instead focuses in on mounting double heat sinks and upgrading its large laser to its ER variant, a Cyclops branded weapon. This means that its ability to fire its laser is improved dramatically, allowing for easier heat cycling and allowing for greater and more consistent damage output. Better yet, its ER weapon has better range and doesn't run the mech so hot that it meaningfully impedes it. It more or less perfects the shortcomings of the original model, using two upgrades, making it a true, complete package. Many clan warriors would underestimate its durability and versatility during the war, and much to their own misfortune. While not able to outfight its clan peers one-on-one, -on -one, as a part of a unit, they are unignorable and unable to be avoided. Once they cling to their victim, clan or inner sphere in nature, the wolfhound's target can be isolated and destroyed. It is superb in this role, and proves teamwork outpaces individual martial skill. The WLF-2 was likely the best inner sphere light mech of the initial clan invasion. While the Wolfhound would always be built exclusively in the Lyran Commonwealth, this does not mean that their military products cannot end up outside of their own borders, either through exports to third parties and then redistribution of weapons to said hostile states, or through legal direct sales. Sometimes large quantities of weapons may be salvaged after years of warfare. Either way, during the Dark Age era, a new variant of the Wolfhound would emerge, and it would be a broad export model, typically upgraded on-site by the successor states of the Free Worlds League. This was a large reimagining of the Wolfhound's role in an army, and while interesting, it may be somewhat of an underperformer. It reduces its armored protection by a half a ton to seven tons, and installs a light fusion engine in order to save several tons of weight. 
It also replaces its normal frame with an endo steel one. All of this weight saved is for one singular purpose. To replace the entirety of its onboard weapons with a single light gauss rifle mounted in the right arm. This transforms the Wolfhound from a mixed brawler to a dedicated sniper platform, moving at maximum range and firing its needling gauss rifle attacks to harass and disrupt enemy units. Using its speed to stay at this range, it will rarely be threatened by serious competition, though its ammunition is somewhat lacking. While it can do this role, certainly, it also is very true that this makes the Wolfhound undergunned in this very role, losing out on most of its firepower. But again, this isn't the intention for this design. It is meant to stay at a minimum threat range to itself and simply back up other units with direct fire support and harassment. It does this job to a satisfactory degree, but it's not perfect. This is a sidestep, an oddity in the evolution of the Wolfhound. With the passage of time, domestically, the Leering Commonwealth would evolve the Wolfhound once more in its original role, and turn it once again into one of the most dangerous killers of its age and era. With a devastating weapons package, and by using technologies to push the design to its furthest point possible upon its deployment. While House Steiner does have access to Clan XL engine technologies, it doesn't always use them due to cost, and the Wolfhound was opted to not be worth the expense, rightly so, for this kind of rare and highly sought after technology. Instead, it would be given a traditional XL engine in order to save weight, though this does come at the potential cost of durability. This engine is also increased in size to a 245 XL engine, giving it a maximum speed of 118 km per hour. This new speed means it can achieve higher defensive bonuses, and is a harder target to escape from. Heat sinks are improved to 11, giving it 22 sinking ability with its double heat sinks. To add further to this, in the right arm, in order to enhance its ability to hit with its primary weapon, an AES system, or Actuator Enhancement System, has been installed. One of the most devastating things about the 6S is this weapon, which so much of the mech is focused on. That is because it is a large, re-engineered laser. These weapons aren't the most powerful in the game against battle mechs using standard armor plating, or some form of ferrofibrous but are catastrophic against specialist armor types, especially hardened armor. Re-engineered lasers ignore the special properties of what their target is defended with that would typically reduce laser effectiveness. Namely, reflective armor, barrel lamellar armor, and the aforementioned hardened armor. With its high speed and accuracy on this system as well, every turn the Wolfhound is deployed against a mech with these properties, in a formation of battle mechs, of course. This will degrade their enemy's capabilities. To back up its primary system, it has three inner sphere ER medium lasers mounted into its torsos, which can further enhance any pain this mech is adding to the situation. And to defend itself against infantry and battle armor and back attacks, it has a small X-Pulse laser. The Wolfhound 6S is a fascinating upgrade, taking what made the original great and pushing it into the new era of warfare. With faster movement and updated weaponry, it can still act as a brawler against other light mechs, but it can also harass against heavier assets in a very serious way. Few who pay the price to have hardened armor would be excited to see it peeled away with such ease from a light mech, while their mech engages other monsters on the battlefield. The Wolfhound is one of the greatest light mechs ever produced. This isn't a controversial statement to say. It, in almost every one of its major configurations, has played a respectable role in the lore and has a respectable appearance on the tabletop. Its storied history began with the Inner Sphere having a light mech that could keep pace with the clans, and that came from its brilliant introduction and its connection to some of the most famous mercenaries in the history of Battletech. The Wolfhound is the face of the Kelhounds, Wolfstragoons, 
and even light mechs of the Federated Commonwealth, and later simply the Lyran Commonwealth. The Draconis Combine trembled at its coming. The clans underestimated at their own peril. And now, in the later eras of Battletech, it again has found a dedicated, lethal niche in order to exploit and overrun anyone foolish enough to simply disregard it as a mere light mech. The Lyran Commonwealth is wrongly viewed through the lens of memes, and even memes that aren't particularly accurate. Despite their shortcomings in many spaces, the Wolfhound was introduced to them as a means to deal with an area which they struggled in, both in-universe and without. The Wolfhound demonstrates that there are not only competent light mechs in their inventory, but literally the best the Inner Sphere has to offer. This Canid battle mech is proof, in essence, that memes taken too seriously can result in complete tactical and strategic failure. I'm sure there have been more than a few mech commanders snickering at the fortune of facing large, slow formations of Steiner battle mechs only to see several wolfhounds pop their heads up from behind the hill instead. Thank you for joining me here today. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. I do updates very frequently and you'll be happy with the content, I think. Also, a huge thank you to all the YouTube members for this channel. When you hit the join button and become a member, you take an extra step in supporting the content on this channel and I can't thank you enough, because this content is only made possible because of viewers like you. And with that, I will see all of you in the comment section below.